In today's mini lecture, I will discuss the arms and armor of the Cimmerians and Scythians. The arms and armor of the Cimmerians and Scythians are indeed unique. The one thing one shall notice is the evolution of their arms and armor over time. This was ne necessary due to the forces they faced in the harsh terrain they lived on, which caused them to change and adapt to, the, to their enemy quickly. They studied what, what, uh, what best worked for them in peacetime and imp implemented it during wartime to give the opponent the maximum effect. Before we start to examine the arms and armor of the Cimmerians and Scythians, it is necessary to lump them together as one entity. The, the reason is that these two groups are difficult to tell apart due to their similarity, similar lifestyle. Only by name do we get an idea of who they are, but as you will read, even this can be intricate. Therefore, we must examine the early period first and work our way through history, noticing the ever-changing styles of arms and armor of these nomadic equestrians before we go into the early accounts told by those who faced or observed them. Now understand about the term Scythian and Cimmerian. Now whether they're related or not, I think they're related though. However, I think it's kind of half and half because I, I believe I've mentioned before in previous video that the, that the term Scythian, is, it's a generic term. There's not really a whole lot to it. Because a lot of the ancient historians, when they look north, or northeast, I guess you could say if you're from Greece, you're looking northeast, or if you're in Persia, you're looking north, that was the land of the Scythians. Therefore, it's really a generic name because there's a lot of different tribes that are living up there, and they're all very much different. Whether they're all related, that's disputed. But in any case, let's just suppose that they're related somewhat seems to possibly culturally more than anything due to their arms and armor. They all seem to, uh, to take one from one another what works best and what doesn't due to their terrain, due to their environment, and due to their neighbors. Cimmerian and Scythian body armor. This will be the next subject here. The Cimmerian and Scythian body armor. The description you're about to read may sound as if body armor had an appearance somewhat like that of medieval knights of Europe. The Greek historian Herodotus describes in detail how these nomadic equestrians looked in military apparel. Quote, in their dress and mode of living, the Massengayi resemble the Scythians. They fight both on horseback and on foot. Neither method is strange to them. They use bows and lances, but their favorite weapon is the battle axe. Their arms are all either of gold or brass. For their spear points and arrowheads, and for their battle axes, they make use of brass. For headgear, belts, and girdles of gold. So too with the um, so too with the comparison uh, comparison of their horses. They give them breastplates of brass, but employ gold about the reins, the bit, and the cheek, cheek plates. They use neither iron nor silver, having none in their country, but they have brass and gold in abundance. End quote. Another description of Scythian body armor comes from the historian Justin, in which he states, quote, Their armor and that of their horses is formed of plates, lapping over one another like the feathers of a bird, and covered both man and horse entirely, end quote. The two descriptions show a well-armored horse and rider. However, this raises a question. Who influenced these nomads to cover their mounts and themselves in armor? The answer may point to none other than the Mesopotamians. The Assyrians may have influenced the Cimmerians and Scythians to use body armor and to develop it further. The historian and archaeologist, by any means I cannot pronounce this guy's name, uh, Taruz uh, Sulamursky, whoever he is, my apologies, uh, makes note of this and, and mentions that the Scythian armored cavalry was a mirror image of the Assyrian cavalry. This tells us the Cimmerians and Scythians are close are close to the Assyrians in both political and military relations, as you should read about later. Actually, as I, I think I believe I've demonstrated it already somewhat with uh, the uh, lecture on Dogdami and on Medius. If you haven't, if you haven't uh, heard those lectures, I suggest you go check them out. There's actually more on my website www.camry.org if you want to read more about Doug Dammy and Medes. Alright. 
The Assyrians wore what is called lamellar armor. The Assyrian armor was composed of leather, sewn or glued together. Next, they would attach iron or bronze plates to the hardened leather. Each individual plate was joined, joined to the next with no overlapping and held in place with either stitching or glue. The total weight of the Assyrian corslet uh, roughly weighed 30 pounds, making the corslet light and flexible to maneuver in. The armor corslet of the Scythians and Cimmerians is somewhat similar. The Scythians and Cimmerians were archers first, but not all were light archers. The type of armor they wore would have been lighter, more flexible material of hardened leather or hide, sometimes overlapped with iron or bronze scales. The metal scales used to overlap the leather or hardened hide had to be cut from a sheet of metal with special tools. Once cut, the individual pieces were attached to the soft leather using leather thong, uh, thongs or animal tendons. Each scale was positioned sideways to the next overlapping about one-third or one-half of the next scale. This would protect the stitching so as not to expose it to hand, to, uh, to hand or projectile weaponry. Once the corslet was finished, it had the look of fish scales. The body armor varied, for not every Scythian or Cimmerian wore full body armor from front to back. Some variations from the neck down to the upper breast while others had a full armored front but not the back. Short sleeved corslets are common and only a few long sleeved corslets have been found. Some used extra scaled body armor that is in smaller pieces. Smaller armor was placed on the upper back over the shoulders and covering the sides of the chest. Smaller scaled pieces like the ones used for the shoulders were utilized to protect the elbows of the rider, rider as well. These smaller plates allowed for maximum flexibility for a rider to function properly on the field of battle with little hindrance to movement. Overall, the design of the Scythian corslet is made to take a pounding. Of course, aren't they all? With overlapping scales protecting the next scale as well as protecting the stitching underneath, it would take a well-sustained volley of arrows for even one arrow to find a space just wide enough to penetrate and injure or kill the man. However, that depends also on the how powerful the bow is and the type of arrow it's coming in. Shin armor, like the upper body armor, is also made of leather covered with metal scales or plates. The Scythians would replace this type of armor in favor of greaves, like the ones the Greeks wore. They also made uh, they also made of um, made of they were also made of metal in favor of uh, made oh, sorry they were also made of metal and were solid rather than scale. However, these solid metal greaves may have been limited to heavy cavalry. Although many carvings, jewelry, and reliefs depict the Scythians in light war attire, only a few depict them in full body armor. The Scythians would also decorate their solid metal greaves with images of the face of the Gorgon on their knees, while the sides of the greaves depicted snakes slithering down. These images, like many in the ancient world, whether on a shield, breastplate, or greaves, were designed to intimidate the enemy. The face of the Gorgon used by the Scythians is indeed to inspire fear, for the Gorgon represents sudden death. The Scythians had a weapon that could inflict sudden death, snake venom, which is an issue we will discuss shortly. Much of the artwork that depicts the Scythians show them in light armor versus the heavy armor mentioned earlier. Many Scythians and Cimmerians who wore heavy armor may have been nobili nobility. Herodotus mentions a group known as the Royal Scythians who lived north of the Black Sea. Herodotus describes them as being, quote, the largest and bravest of the Scythian tribes, which looks upon all the other tribes in the light of slaves, end quote. These other nomadic uh, tribes are commoners or common Scythians who hold no title of nobility. Herodotus describes them as being, quote, separated, Quote, end quote, by the Gurus River from the Royal Scythian and says, quote, the river on its passage towards the sea divides the country of the nomadic from the Royal Scythians, end quote. Herodotus' depiction of the nomadic and Royal Scythians suggests that there were far more horse archers than heavy cavalry based on social class. And also, it's a lot cheaper to be a light cavalryman than a heavy. An example of social class can be observed in, in the Battle of, uh, Battle of Carrhae between Roman Parthia and 53 BCE. Plutarch, a Roman historian, mentions that horse archers do not engage the Roman forces, 
but the heavy Parthian cavalry would lance through Roman lines. Whereas Herodotus makes the claim that earlier that earlier Massengedi horsemen are all, are well armored. This is not to say they were not, but we should not assume that all Scythian subtribes were armor clad. Now I'm going to end the, that mini lecture on the Scythian body armor. Um, the next lecture I think we're going to focus when it comes to the Scythians because there's a lot of interesting stuff about these guys. We're going to I think we'll look at um, the helmet next, and then we'll, I'll probably go ahead and piece together the rest. We'll do the helmet, the axe, lance, uh, javelin, sword, all the handheld weapons. We'll do next. We'll, and, and we'll end it with the bow. I think the bow and arrow would probably be the last great piece to really discuss. Alright, if you like this little mini lecture, give me a thumbs up. Leave your comments below. If you, no fighting, of course. I will leave the references to this lecture. Actually, there's only really one if you want to go to my web. Well, actually, not just the website. But go to my website, www.camray.org. That's www.camrea.org. I'll leave a link in the description. But if you want to know more about the Scythians and Cimmerians, I suggest that you pick up my ebook or my physical copy of March of the Scythians, which was published in 2013. All right, that's it. I hope you have a great weekend. Until next time.